This is Russia, today. A desert wasteland overrun by hungry zombies who've looted all the food from supermarkets. From St. Petersburg to Vladivostok, from Yekaterinburg to Murmansk, it's now impossible to find even a single Western brand. While Putin at the Kremlin weeps over economic sanctions, you're chilling. Because in the dead of night, you can leave your Soviet bloc, make your way through the snow, and sink your teeth into a greasy, filthy sandwich from Bukuzno i Tochka, the new McDonald's made in Mother Russia, and challenge some unlikely YouTuber to food challenge. What's so nuts about this whole thing? Pretty much everything, except the McDonald's knockoff. It's now 2024, and a few months ago, Kuzne Tochka, which literally means tasty and period, went viral here on YouTube. In May 2022, McDonald's decided to leave Russian soil. To do so, it sold about 850 restaurants to Alexander Govor, a billionaire who owns half a construction company that controls an oil refinery on the island of Yaya in Siberia, and who had already been managing 25 McDonald's franchise outlets since 2015. This didn't just happen with them, you know? In July 2022, 130 Starbucks stores were bought for just 6 million and renamed Stars Coffee. The buyers are entrepreneur Anton Pinsky and rapper Timati, a big fan of Putin, so much so to have dedicated a song to him in 2015. Last August, Pinsky and Timati even bought Domino's Pizza. I'm launching a petition right here and now to bring Domino's Pizza back to Italy. Anyway, in the last year and a half, hundreds of other Western brands have faced a similar fate. Since the war in Ukraine started, over a thousand companies have either paused or completely stopped their operations in Russia. Meta, Apple, Renault, Shell, Google, just a few of the giants that made a run for it. The reason? Sanctions. We've heard about these sanctions for a while now, so let's quickly dive into what they are and what they entail. Take the European Union sanctions, for example. Putin, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Russian parliamentarians and military officials, the so-called oligarchs, banks, and companies in the defense sector have had a total of 21.5 billion euros of their assets frozen. The Russian central bank can't touch about 300 billion euros. That's because all monetary transactions between Russia and EU and G7 countries have been blocked, along with air travel and maritime traffic. There are also heavy restrictions on exports and imports. Specifically, EU member countries can't export technological products, vehicles, weapons, and luxury goods to Russia, nor can they provide consulting in the fields of IT, accounting, legal, engineering, and advertising. The mass exit of Western multinationals from Russia has a double motive. The first, humanitarian, to support the cause of an invaded country. And within this, there's also an image concern. Many multinationals don't like the idea of being called out on social media and in public still operating in Russia, so better to avoid any image backlash. The second, and undoubtedly most important for a CEO, is purely economic. Doing business with sanctions in place isn't good for profits and investors. Yet, not all companies see it this way. In fact, according to the Leave Russia website, which monitors the activities of foreign companies in Russia, out of 3,655 brands, only 1,500 have ceased their operations or are about to. Another 500 are taking a wait-and-see approach, and nearly 1,600, despite public outrage and balance sheets, have decided to stay. Politico, on the other hand, reports that only 8% of European companies have stopped doing business in Russia. What's the point of staying? Well, a primary concern for multinationals is the continuity of their business. If a company suddenly shut down production plant and stores, it would face management costs for unused premises and machinery, lose a significant market share, and not least lay off hundreds if not thousands of employees. When McDonald's, Starbucks, and other fast food chains like Pizza Hut and KFC sold their outlets to Russian buyers, they signed contracts that would allow them to buy them back within 15 years and for the now former employees to work in the substitute chains for at least two years. But clearly, these brands left Mother Russia not so much out of compassion for Ukraine, but because they could afford to. For example, German Ritter claims it stayed because the Russian markets account for 7% of its total revenue. The Anglo-Swedish pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca believes it's crucial to keep distributing medicines in Russian soil. Moreover, companies like Lactalis, Ferrero, Pepsi, and Bonduel continue to sell their products undisturbed, either under different brands or by declaring that profits from the Russian market will be donated to humanitarian aid or the reconstruction of Ukraine. But some think they're playing it smart. Swiss giant Nestle announced it would suspend the sale of KitKat and Nesquik, and other non-essential goods, but simultaneously sells Russian versions of its flagship products. 
In March 2022, the Coca-Cola company decided to make a run for it from Russia. However, its Russian subsidiary remained active, is still owned by the European subsidiary Coca-Cola HBC, changed its name to Molten Partners, and began selling instead of Coca-Cola, Dobrikola, which is nothing but a covert clone. Convenient. The advantage for these multinationals is that there are no sanctions or limitations on the import-export of essential goods, agricultural products, and pharmaceuticals. According to Novaya Gazeta Europe, an independent Russian outlet, in 2022, the 100 largest Western companies in Russia recorded profits of $13 billion, 54% higher than in 2021. Apple, IKEA, and BMW, on the other hand, producing goods mentioned by the sanctions, would find it difficult to sell them in Russia, and therefore were forced to pack up. In a nutshell, multinational companies still in Russia see it as a profitable market slice. Even with an ongoing conflict, they probably think it's crucial to maintain their investments there. From a purely economic perspective, they're diversifying their market reach. This same logic applies to our savings and investments. Scalable Capital, today's video sponsor, knows this well. Not familiar with Scalable? That's a miss, because already 700,000 people are already using it. Scalable is a safe, regulated, and intuitive German broker managing over 15 billion in savings through this app. With Scalable's app, you can buy stocks, funds, and ETFs, aiming to build a solid and diversified portfolio that can withstand current and future economic challenges. Thanks to the Insights feature, you can analyze your portfolio's diversification and the impact various scenarios could have on it, like global stock downturns, interest rate hikes, or inflation periods. Essentially, Scalable saves you hundreds in consultancy fees and hours of work. You can then find the best diversification opportunities for your investments, perhaps focusing on single stocks of companies unaffected by sanctions and operating smoothly even after leaving the Russian market, like Ferrari in this specific case. By the way, despite sanctions, Russian billionaires have managed to import supercars back home. So much for loopholes. Moreover, as you can see here, creating a personalized saving plan with Scalable is super easy, regardless of the desired amount, even just a single euro. Just set a monthly amount, schedule the deposit day, and choose the ETF. Every month, that amount is withdrawn from your account and invested without any further worry, all at a cost of a tenth of what major banks charge with the option to freely cancel or modify your savings plan. Also, if you decide to choose Prime Plus, you'll earn 4% annual interest on the balance you don't decide to invest for the first four months, and 2.6% after that. In short, Scalable is the simplest and most affordable option for those wanting to invest some of their capital that's just gathering dust in bank accounts. Leaving your savings to gather dust in a bank account isn't an option anymore in 2024. It's not just to shield against phenomena like inflation, but also a way to add value over the years to your invested savings. But back to our story. As always, link in the description with all the details. But back to our story, several companies did prefer to wait out the Ukraine conflict's developments to save both goat and cabbage. But it didn't really go well for some. French company Danone continued operating in Russia, but was also negotiating to sell its subsidiaries. The Danish Carlsberg did the same until in October 2022, the Russian Duma issued a counter sanction stating 45 foreign banks, including Unicredit and Credit Suisse, could no longer move capital. In other words, Western companies with accounts at those banks could invest but not divest. The deadlock was resolved by Putin himself in July 2023 who seized the Russian subsidiaries of Danone and Carlsberg, placing them under control of Yakub Zakriev, the agriculture minister of Chechenia, and Taimuraz Bolev, a longtime friend of his. The takeover is legitimized by a law introduced at the beginning of 2023 that allows the seizure of assets and properties belonging to hostile countries, a situation that also occurred in April with the forced acquisition of the subsidiaries of two European energy companies. To sum up, we have three scenarios, brands that didn't care and stayed, brands that got trapped, and brands that were left and then replaced by more or less improbable copies. In this last category, in addition to McDonald's and Starbucks, Lego transformed into World of Cubes, the Finnish dairy company Valio, whose cheeses and yogurts are widespread in Russia, now magically renamed to Viola, Fanta and Sprite rebranded as Fancy and Street by Molten Partners, which also introduced Cool Cola. Zara, Poland Bear, Stradivarius and Bershka, owned by the Spanish group Inditex, whose stores have changed names to Mag, Dube, Aircrew, and Villet, and IKEA replaced by Sweet House, its Belarusian imitation. Now, the picture may seem complete, but there's something quite strange. And not everything seems to go according to plan. Although their stores have closed in Moscow, it's still possible to find and buy, among others, 
Apple, Adidas, Zara, Mercedes, Chanel, and Ikea products. Besides Dobri Cola and Cool Cola, supermarket shelves are full of genuine Coca-Cola, as well as Bailey's and Captain Morgan Run. Moreover, Russians can continue to buy Garnier shampoo, Chevrolet or Volkswagen cars, musical instruments, microphones, boats, and even locomotives without any problem. But didn't we say that sanctions prevent selling these types of goods? Here's the catch. And this time it's not the companies being sly, but Russia itself. To quote Trap, don't say cat if you don't have it in the sack. On May 6, 2022, the Russian Ministry of Industry and Trade published a list of 56 groups of goods that can be subject to parallel importation. Parallel imports refer to goods imported into market without a license and the consent of the producers. In short, here's how it works. Western companies continue to operate in the global market as before the invasion of Ukraine. This means they can sell good in countries like Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, or the UAE, China and Turkey. All these countries, for convenience or friendship, share the fact of not having applied sanctions against Russia. Consequently, a Russian retailer can easily place an order, say for a thousand iPhones originally destined for Astana in Kazakhstan, make a deal under the table with some local licensee, pay them a commission, and bring them all the way back to Yekaterinburg, the nearest city, to then distribute them in Russian stores. BMW, for example, can be produced in Chennai, India, and then shipped to dealerships in Dubai. These are transported to the port of Anzali in Iran, from where they reach Astrakhan in Russia, to then comfortably reach Moscow dealerships and then be resold at slightly higher prices. And magically, Western brands return in grand style to the great mother Russia. What can multinationals do to stop these parallel imports? Not much. And then, come on, do they really want to? At most, they keep an eye on demand in states bordering Russia. In the case of Germany, in the first four months of 2023, exports to Armenia increased by 132%, while those in Kyrgyzstan by 773%. Hmm, what a coincidence. Moreover, the Kremlin has abolished criminal and admin responsibility for intermediary smuggling goods from countries that have imposed sanctions. It's no problem. Finally, Moscow avails itself on the international principle of copyright exhaustion. According to which, once a good is sold for the first time in a country, the producing company cannot oppose subsequent commercializations. To make things worse is the fact that nothing stops Russian retailers from trafficking goods from NATO countries, like neighboring Poland. Hey, Dr. Pepper, where is this from? Where was it imported from? Poland! Ah, and obviously to import Western goods into Russia, you don't need to be a KGB spy or operate in the shadows of illegality. Just use the internet. Take Yandex, Russia's second most popular search engine, for example. Among its various services, Yandex also has an e-commerce platform, Yandex Market. Whether you're in Novgorod, Kazan, or Kamchatka, all you need to do is type in a keyword in the search bar, pick a product, add it to your cart, and buy it. Some items even list where they're from. Another trick, just having a friend in Georgia to get your new shiny Volvo delivered. That makes you wonder if sanctions even make any sense. According to Forbes, Italy, in 2022, Russia might have imported up to 20 billion in products through parallel channels. Even if this number is a bit exaggerated, it pales in comparison to Moscow's 213 billion in imports. In other words, parallel imports don't play a big role in Russia's economy, in fact, some sectors, like the automotive industry, really felt the absence of Western and Japanese brands. By the end of 2022, the vehicle production hubs in Kaluga and Kaliningrad regions saw a recession of 16-17%. to 17 Now their industries are shifting to assembling Chinese cars. Clever, right? As a famous professor who studies pocket monsters would say, now's not the time or place to dive into the economic impact of sanctions. There are too many factors to consider, but let me leave you with some food for thought. Despite what you might think, depending on who's making the estimates, Russia's GDP grew by 1% to 3.5% in 2023. This growth disproves the notion that the Eurasian giant would implode, but it's heavily influenced by increased military spending for the conflict in Ukraine.
One thing's for sure, if you look hard enough in Moscow or St. Petersburg, you could find the same goods sold in Milan, Rome, and Prato, my hometown. Well, maybe not the same stuff from Via Pistoies in Prato, that's hard to find. Budweiser, Stella, Nutella's just as expensive as before the war, and Lay's is just as popular as before. Whatever your thoughts on the sanctions, it's clear that the restrictions on importing and exporting Western goods are creating two equally unwanted and harmful effects. First, as sociologist Grigory Yudin says, Putin doesn't want Russians changing their habits. Western consumer goods, which might seem trivial, actually hold a lot of value for the average Russian. Sure, it's a shame that this category includes items like iPhones and cars, mostly available in big cities. There is luxury goods that, rather than doing a favor for the so-called average Russian, maintain the lifestyle of wealthy Russians living in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Secondly, even though parallel imports have been legalized in Russia, the sanctions have given birth to, or revived, smuggling channels that will be hard to shut down even after the conflict ends, especially since they're lucrative for those involved. So-called Nurbek, a Kyrgyzstan citizen interviewed by The Guardian, says he gets a 5% commission on the final sale of Apple products. So I'm making really good money. It is better than working in construction or as a taxi driver. If only he knew the taxi prices in Italy. But we'll tell him when we're in Kyrgyzstan in June. Remember, donations are still open. So let's be wary of propaganda from both sides, but don't think Russia will be defeated just because a fast food chain decides to sell its stores, or because some company decides to donate its profits to Ukraine's reconstruction. Pira, spira.